She kept me out until about uh -huh. 10 up in Muncie, and mm -hmm. it was eight o'clock this morning. <laughs> it's like, oops. Okay. Irma has a prelude for us, and we'll begin. <clears throat> Well, uh, there's a joke among uh, liberal unprogrammed FGC friends that um, they do a, the kids play kind of bingo about uh, when different messages start. And one of the, the bingo questions is, uh, how long is it going to take somebody to say, well, as I heard on NPR this morning. <laughs> um, and so, uh, I have a call to worship that's along those lines, but it's uh, from Carrie Newcomer's new book called Until Now, New Poems. And it says, uh, what you won't hear on cable news. I want to tell you what you won't hear on cable news about a young woman at the airport who was so exhausted and harried by hours of delay and, a, and wrangling an overtired toddler, that when her little boy finally and completely 
melted down and planted himself on the floor, she sat down beside him and started to cry. I want to tell you about five random women who immediately flowed in from all directions. One pulled out a little toy from her purse. One offered a snack or to go get something to drink. One who called the child honey, wiped his nose with a tissue and offered another to the grateful mother. And the one who asked if it was all right to walk hand in hand with the child right there at the gate, close by and always in sight. Are there joys and concerns to share this morning? I found out that a very dear friend of mine that I worked with for probably 30 years passed away. And uh, if we could hold her son Cam in the light, I'm sure he would appreciate it. It's a joy to be among Friends United meeting people, hear the absolutely miraculous reports of our field staff, all the wonderful things that are happening, um, and seeing friends, probably around 65 people were on each day of the Zoom FUM board meetings. It's just, it's just wonderful to rub elbows with all those people from such a long way. So we did have the joy of going to, wasn't really a wedding, I guess. It was a renewal of vows of a couple who was married a year ago. Uh, and then the pandemic, of course, made their official uh, wedding uh, plans, moved them back an entire year. And as I stood up, uh, it was at Friends Memorial where I used to be the pastor and Erin was one of the young friends when we were there. She was 15 when we left. It's hard to believe. I'm 35 now and her, some of their buddies were all there and their parents and to see people. But as I stood on the stage and Erin and Scott's real anniversaries today, their first one, we were married on the second, and it hit me that on Friday was my parents' 72nd anniversary would have been. But to be in that space and talking about weddings and thinking of the wedding in Galilee, the first miracle, it was just, uh... but even there, COVID re reared its ugly head because her sister, who is matron of honor and also got married this spring, <clears throat> her father-in-law, who had refused to be vaccinated, got COVID and had to be rushed to the hospital and put on life support. And uh, she had to leave and could not be part of her sister's vows, renewal of vows. So it was bittersweet in lots of ways. Uh, I would ask you to keep uh, Coach Jerry Rushton and his wife Nanette in your thoughts and prayers this morning. Uh, Jerry was Loring and mine cross country and track coach at Erland College. And he has recently had to go into an assisted living facility and uh, not doing real great as I understand. So uh, would ask you to keep uh, Jerry and Annette and their family in your prayers this morning. He taught in the Decatur schools before he went to Earlham.
And let us uh, hold joys and concerns in our hearts and enter into a period of silence. And I'm the, the running late worship leader today, but um, I'll speak out the silence is led. Loving and gracious God, we give you thanks that we can gather today. We hold those who are mourning loss, ask that you would uphold them, those who are facing physical diminishments, realizing in some ways how closely uh, grief and joy seem to walk together these days. We do thank you for the joys in our lives, even as we mourn the losses and diminishments. For the joys of weddings, for the joys of seeing seasons turn for the joy of harvest time. So I'm sure we could wish for some drier days down here in Indiana. We lift all these things to you and ask that you place them in your care as we know they are, but also help us be able to reach out to each other in fellowship and support one another in ways that are needed. Amen. Well, I do have a very short <laughs> scripture reading just because uh, my evangelical upbringing kicks in generally when I speak and there always is a scripture involved. Um, but this one has been with me all week. Um, it's Matthew 25, 40, and the king will answer, in truth I tell you, insofar as you did this to one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did it to me. Insofar as you did this to one. Uh, I just finished a book this week that was both challenging and enjoying, enjoyable. It was, uh, it's called Taking the World in for Repairs. It's not a new book. It came out in 87. It's uh, by Richard Selzer, who uh, was a surgeon in uh, upstate New York. And in addition to being a writing, he also taught writing. Uh, The only part I didn't enjoy uh, was the fact that he is such a good writer <laughs> that I, I just didn't want to write anymore. I mean, I will, but it was, I mean, if you want to read just, if you don't care even what the stories are about, his writing is just amazing and uh, brings you into it. I mean, it starts out with a time he was traveling in, in Venice and I had forgotten to make reservations, and so ends up staying in a monastery for like a month and a half out on an island. And and he's not religious. <laughs> he's spiritual, but he's not religious, and what it was like to live with these monks. But the uh, it's a book that's aged well. A friend of mine, Katie Patterson, recommended it to me and actually bought it and sent it to me. Um, But the last essay in there is the one uh, that the book takes its title from, Taking the World in for Repairs. Uh, Seltzer, as I said, was primarily a surgeon. 
And this uh, piece, last piece, is about him going on a trip to Arequipa, Peru, and serving in a rather dilapidated, overcrowded uh, hospital to provide surgery services to an indigenous population. He was going with a, a group that does plastic surgery, cosmetic surgery. Um, and uh, he didn't do so much of that except assist on helping people uh, uh, with uh, sutures and those sorts of things that he was skilled at. It was an interesting mix of people from all around uh, the world who went, doctors and nurses, uh, many of the indigenous people uh, did not speak Spanish even. They spoke the tongue of the mountains around this town that, and that's what I thought of it as, a town that we had never heard of. It's a city of a million people. It's one of the oldest cities in South America. It was a major trade place for the uh, Incas and their empire. Um, but there was a, a predominance of cleft palates and cleft lips that were just genetic running through this population. And he ends the essay by saying, tomorrow we leave Peru carrying with us the pathetic belief that the way to heal the world is to take it in for repairs one-on-one, -on -one, one at a time. Now, first, I reacted against that word pathetic. I mean, it's often used, you know, it well, isn't that pathetic or uh, kind of in a snide sort of way, but I consulted the dic dictionary and saw that it also means having the capacity to move one to compassionate pity. Something pathetic can move us to compassionate pity, which is a good thing, I think. Um, and the thing I resonated most in this was the idea that we work with God in repairing the world one-on-one, -on -one, one at a time, which I found reassuring at one level, which means I don't have to do it all, and I often want to try and do it all, but I found it challenging uh, because it means I have to do something. And then I uh, began to think about our friends' organizations, larger ones, and if they're repairing the world one-on-one -on -one, or if they're uh, spending a lot of time maintaining organizations and staff. I'm cynical that way. I was especially considering that as we discern who we want to support via the Carol Mills Outreach Fund. How do we make sure that we repair the world one-on-one, -on -one, even if we're not the ones going out to do it, to enable this one-on-one? -on -one? And I look back on times, and perhaps I'm too critical, but I think of the American Friends Service Committee and Friends Britain's Friends Service Council, who fed, housed, and clothed people in Europe between the World Wars and following the Second World War, and the old Friends Ambulance Unit, which did the same and went into Normandy right after D-Day and, and fed and clothed uh, the people who in that war-wracked land and up to Belgium and, and worked one-on-one. -on -one not on big ideas, not on protest, but the big things, one-on-one. -on -one. What are we doing today? And then uh, the FUM letter came and I'm thinking, okay, we'll see what they're doing one-on-one. -on -one. And there was a letter in there about the Girl Child Education Fund, which we're considering helping was uh, by a young woman, uh, Joyce Asimut Simiu, I don't know how to say it. 
she's now 36, but <coughs> as a child, she attend, attended the Turkana, Turkana Primary Education School, and she was a very good student, but her parents didn't have very much money. And they weren't going to be able to go on to uh, higher education, you know, or secondary education. Uh, and they were members of uh, a friend's church there. So they talked to their pastor and learned of the Child Education Fund. And she received a scholarship, which about 40 girls a year do, to attend the Kang Kangatith High School to pers pursue her Kenyan Certificate of Secondary Education, and she graduated in 2004. And in 2006, World Vision Kenya was advertising for job positions for food monitors in the country to undertake food distribution, to avert drought, starvation. So she applied and got the job. And when she was there, uh, she met her husband. <laughs> and got married and they didn't have two boys. Then she left to join the African Institute of Research and Development Studies to get a diploma in community health and development. So in 2011, she began to work for the Kenyan government in community health extension work. And she applied to it, uh, she was posted to a dispensary, dispensary in the Cthulhu division in Turkana South. And she also enrolled at Mount Kenya University to undertake a bachelor's degree in environmental science in two and graduate in 2017. And she writes, if not for the girl child education scholarship, I would probably be a street woman, a single mother or housemaid. May God continue to bless those who give to this program so that more challenged girls in Africa will be helped. Taking the world in for repairs. We do this for one of the least of these. One. I know many of us are involved in organizations in our community and worldwide. Some of us are more active in providing direct services than others of us, depending on where we are in our life. But whether through our donations or direct action, may we individually and as a meeting continue our work with God in the healing of creation. And so I'm going to rephrase uh, Selzer's closing sentences in his book. Today, as we leave this meeting house, may we carry with us the pathetic but blessed belief that the way to heal the world is to take it in for repairs, one-on-one, -on -one, one at a time.
of you could have been in Turkana and Samburu, where the people have a lot of ambition and re but the resources are slim. Yeah. Blood and milk still stands. The standard is the standard um, food source for both of those communities. The class school classrooms are quite bare with benches that hold benches made to hold six class children sitting on the floor eager to go to school. It's a dirt floor. A lot of the churches meet under trees because there's no building. Life is hard there. What a great piece of news to hear of this young lady's inspiration and achievement because someone wanted to help. Most of the girls are married by the time they're 12 or 14 or not, but they're mothers. It's a great story. transition to unprogrammed worship. I would remind you that at 1045 we'll have Sunday school and I did send out a link. It's a separate link. So use it and uh, hope to see some of you back again at 1045. Those of you
several years ago, I got poked with that verse that Brent read. Um, the two part story that for a long time, there was a, a guy that would ride around Plainfield on a bicycle. He was pretty scruffy and pretty unkept and had a little bicycle with a basket on the back and there was always a collection of odds and ends in the basket. And I'd see him up and down US 40 and I'd see him around town. And kind of a curiosity is how he got to be where he was because there weren't a whole lot of that kind of people in Plainfield that, uh, that you would notice uh, <clears throat> one sunny summer morning. I was outside and I heard some noises over in the woods across the street. And I went over to look and here's a couple of kittens that had been abandoned, thrown out in the woods. Oh, kittens, how nice. So I went over and I spent probably an hour trying to coax these kittens out of the briars <laughs> so I could grab them and save them from a certainly a coyote meal or whatever they were bound to be over in the woods. And I had spent, you know, quite a while, and there were two or three of them, so I'd catch one and take it back to the house, and then I'd go back and go catch another one. And the last one was the most uh, cautious, and it took quite a while and some ingenuity on my part to, to grab a hold of this thing. So I get these kittens um, in the breezeway and was feeling pretty, pretty uh, good about myself for having rescued these little cats. And, uh, I go inside and I look out the front window and here's Mr. Scruffy and his bicycle sitting in the shade of the trees out by the road. And the first thought was, ah, what's that guy doing here? And that's where I got poked with his verses. He's one of the least. Do something. So I get a pitcher of water and a cup and I take it out and greet him and say, you know, would you like some, some water? Um, he readily accepted the water and you know I didn't want a big conversation didn't want him to feel like he had to tell me his life story so I just said well I'll just leave the picture here and you know enjoy and I walked away I walked back in the house and um, looked out a little bit later and he's gone never saw the guy again never saw him around Plainfield again and the piece that stuck with me was yeah I can say that I did it for the least, one of the least, but I don't know what it did for him. It did more for me than it did for him. The idea that, okay, now you know what that verse means. <laughs> the cats come, the cats go away. Right? <laughs>
Are there any final sharings that friends would like to do before we close this time? At March's 96th birthday is the 9th. Looking for this maybe to be your last one.
but the viewing in uh, in terms of the, the mother of I guess buddy growing up this week uh, had no particular uh, religious affiliation, and so he said some nice words over his mother, and then we had a Kahlua toast at the cemetery, which was a new one for me. He, he said some nice words about the, his mother, which uh, was pretty gracious on his part because he was raised by his grandparents, because she wasn't, uh, wasn't much of a mom when he needed a mom. His sister turned out right. But we'll close this time and uh, we'll do Sunday school starting at about at 10.45. So uh, we'll round up some Bibles and today we're going to talk about Hagar. We have to do Sarah too because their stories are together. But we know a lot about Sarah. But what do we know about Hagar? So, um, peace. Amen. Amen.